Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our channel, Our Scientology Stories, Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I want to introduce my co-host to you. Here's Janice Gillum-Grady. Hi, Janice. How are you doing? Hi, Mark. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our Peeling the Onion channel. We are having a lot of fun doing this. Right, Mark? That's exactly right. And uh, we have, uh, this is a uh, part two of, of our interview we had uh, with Ken Urquhart, who was L. Ron Hubbard's butler at St. Hill and then and moved up to be his L, uh, his personal communicator. And uh, we're going to talk more about uh, being at St. Hill as well as his time on the flagship Apollo and in Clearwater, Florida. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring in Ken Urquhart again. Hi, Ken. Hello, Mark. Hi, Ken. Hi, Janet. Welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be back, and thank you again for having me back. No we problem. Had such, we had such great response to having you on last time, so of course we had to dig you up again and get you back on. All right, anytime. <laughs> also, I, I want to read some of the comments that we got, Ken, off of your off of the video that we put out about you. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. This one. This is a comment that says, "What a charmer Ken is!" Exclamation point. <laughs> Appreciate you all sharing your stories. You are showing those who are under the radar that life can be bigger and better, exclamation point. I hope they get that message. Cheers, exclamation point. So that's Lovely. one. Yeah. And then here's another one here. This was such a fascinating interview and photos really bring everything to life, exclamation point. I'm fascinated with St. Hill prior to the ships. Thank you. Ken, I'm going to take your advice and just take the next job without reading, without, without needing an offer, exclamation point. The insight into the daily life of Ken and his interactions with Hubbards is amazing. Okay. Ken, remember when you talked about your job interview as Butler and how you accepted it and you just took the offer? That's what they're <laughs> referring to. Okay, okay. <laughs> And then we got one more. It says, uh, "What a wonderful guest and story! It's an important. It's important. It's so important that these older stories get documented and preserved. Well done to all." Great. So those are some of the comments that we got, Ken. Lovely. <laughs> yep. Well done to are you. You still there, Ken? Yeah, I'm yeah, still here. Okay, still okay, here. you're there. Okay, great. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to show somebody a slide here, okay? And then we'll get we're going to go into the next uh, phase of this, all right? So this was Ken. This is uh, he was the former LRH personal communicator at St. Hill Apollo flagship and flag land base, and that's Ken back in the day. And then Janice, I'm going to go ahead and put up the uh, the slideshow, and then we'll start going through it, okay? Uh, okay. Are you all set, Ken? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Well, here we go. So this is Ken Urquhart interview part two, and you're off. Go ahead, Janice. Yes. Yeah, so this is just to reestablish with everyone. This is. The little building in the front is the St. Hill Manor, which is where Ken worked as the LRH butler and later as the LRH communicator. And in the background is the castle that was built for the delivery because there wasn't enough room in the rest of the uh, St. Hill Manor grounds. Okay. And then um, Ken, well, let's, yeah. let's go to the next picture and then I'll have Ken kind of point out what's in the different locations of the behind the windows of the manor. Okay. There, so, yes, you see the front door and over to the left of the picture, that single story wing, the three windows at the front and the two on the side, that was his office. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll do it again. Yeah, there, Ken? yeah, he's here. Where are you, Mark? No, I can hear you. Can you? I can see you, but he's okay. frozen. He's frozen. No, he's not. <laughs> now I see it. Now he's moving. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Ken. Describe the photo. Okay. Do you see the front door? And then over to the left, that single-story wing. The three windows at the front and the two on the side to the left, that was LRH's office. The three windows on that same wing to the very left, they were the what we call the winter garden. 
And that's where Ron and Mary Sue had their dining room. Okay. There was a door connecting the two. Right. And that's where, as a kid, I used to play jacks and cards with the Hubbard kids. All right. Just above the door, uh, on that first floor, over to the left, that first window on the front of the house, on the second story up, that was the valet room, uh -huh. an old, old bathroom. And the window, as you go on the side looking towards the left, that first window, well, the first, that, that was his bedroom. Okay. Uh, that's about all I can tell you on that. Oh, to okay. the right of the front door is the kitchen wing. That was also sink. No, that was that was a, a wing that was added onto the house. The kitchen was quite high, and there was a floor of bedrooms above the kitchen that were occupied by the children. Okay. Right. Hey, can I ask Janice this question? And uh, she never tried it or didn't know up above on the roof you see like sort of like a railing was there a way to get up on the roof and have a view of the property do you remember oh, yes yes there was a, a staircase up from the top floor very simple and you could see you could see the the whole property up there i guess yes yeah okay here's the next photo see in that photo you see on top of the right at the top of the building yeah there's a little square thing i see it. yes though that's that's the entrance to the staircase i was talking about okay okay and there you see uh let me ask um, you ken on the left hand side of this photograph it looks like there's a glass roof do you know yes. what that what that is i think that must be the monkey room okay yeah, I don't think it was a glass roof. I think it was just the way it was made. I think there's a, there's a lead stripe. Okay. And the monkey room uh, was a room where uh, an artist had painted various monkeys on the wallpaper. Is that right? Yes. It was. Yeah. So Winston Churchill's grandson is the one who painted those monkeys. Oh, okay. All right. We'll go to the next one here. <laughs> Tell everybody what that is, Janice. Yeah. So. These are little Phaetons. Um, at St. Hill, I remember as a kid, Tox Sondergaard used to draw these. And on the Hubbard Christmas tree or in the winter garden, there were little clouds hanging from the ceiling with these little Phaetons on it. And these, we Tox did these also for a tone scale. And, and this here is a card, you know, that was given to Hubbard for 100% standard tech and different people signed the little Phaetons. Okay. And then our next slide is of Tuck, who was the artist. That's him on the right? Yes, that's him on the right. Okay. Yep. And Ken, who is this? That's Jane Camber, Guardian Worldwide. Right. And she was also in the manor, her office, while you were there? Yes, that was on the ground floor. I think I think she had the office that was next door to Irene Thrupp. Okay. On the on the ground floor. Yeah. So it was a big it was a big house. I mean you i you describe these rooms and I look at the picture, it doesn't look that big, but it, it's actually very big, isn't it? It's it's big as houses go it's not big as a country house it's a small yeah. country house but it's definitely a, a good size behind jane are the windows of ella rachel's bedroom the two okay. the one next to her ear and the one further right of, of that those are ella rachel's bedroom on the second floor on the second floor and, right. and then that, who, were, who was up on the third floor on the uh, above his bedroom was um, a, a sitting room or study mm -hmm. that I, I think I referred to it last time. It was a very beautiful room 
it was obviously professionally designed and put together. Uh, it was just a lovely space. And um, he used that for auditing when he was up and about. Okay. And I remember once, uh, I didn't. I I wasn't aware that he did that. I was in the household, and he said to me one day, one afternoon, "I'm going upstairs." He meant to that room. Ah. And while he was up there, something urgent came up at uh, at reception, and somebody needed to see him. So I went up there, knocked at the door, and put my head around the door, and he was actually on the meter. So I interrupted his session unknowingly, felt very bad, uh -huh. but he, he he answered whatever I had to say and I left and I apologized later and he was okay. But I, I never forgot after that, that when he met, when he said, I'm going upstairs, it meant he was going into session. Okay, and uh, next to those two windows is the bedroom. And the last room, last window you can see there, I think that was my bedroom. Okay. On the third there. floor. Yes. I okay. had just the one window. It was a small room. Did they have a lot of bathrooms in the manor? They had enough. There yeah, no, I, you always ask that, you know, it's five bedrooms and four baths or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that many. There were, there was a, a bathroom en suite. Uh, for LRH's bedroom, uh -huh. there was a bathroom en suite for the room above. There was a bathroom opposite Mary Sue's room. It had obviously been a bedroom converted to a bathroom because it was quite big. There was a bathroom. Was that Mary Sue's bathroom? Yes. Uh, there was a bathroom in the children's wing. There was a one bathroom on up for the people who lived in the manor. Mm -hmm. That was just two of us, I think, in my time. There was one bathroom for them. There was a bathroom on the stairs, on the grand staircase. And there, I know there was one in the basement. Yes. Oh, so there's a whole floor underground. Yeah, there was a basement. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. All right. So the next thing we're going to uh, show you, Ken, is that, you know, current times right now, um, you know, while we're recording this, Danny Masterson, who's a Scientologist, he was just found guilty of uh, raping, uh, forcible rape, actually, against uh, two women who also were Scientologists. And then the third charge, um, the, the jury deadlocked on it. And again, that was a Scientologist as well. And the reason we're bringing this up is because, uh, you know, it's, it's reported that Scientology basically knew everything. This, these incidences happened in 2000 and 2003. And the Scientologist women reported them to her, the ethics officers at Celebrity Center. And then, of course, Scientology again got to the bottom of what was going on, all that. But these women never got their justice, and it got to the point where they eventually decided, hey, we, I, we were going to the police, and they had been stopped to, by going to the police by Scientology. That's what's been charged. At any rate, uh, Janice has been asked about well, what would L. Ron Hubbard have done if it had been reported that a Scientologist had been accused of raping another Scientologist. And we have this next slide here, which is a Something I guess L. Ron Hubbard wrote. Is that in the 1960s, Janice? Does it look like? Yes. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. It's uh, October 30th. Anybody, and it's got LRH's initial next to us. It says, anybody, if anyone does anything to get any of these organizations in bad publicity, such as narcotics charges, drunk driving, or other unsavory data, I have a policy. I will beat their teeth in personally. Sincerely, LRH. Okay. So Janice, I wanted to ask you, you know, and also you can, you know, were there any incidences or things that happened either at St. Hill or on the ship uh, where, you know, some crew member or some public person got involved with something that uh, would require, you know, Scientology to take action? Yeah, I'll stop, I'll stop this off. 
Yeah, we had a few instances on the ship where a 17 year old was, you know, a man slept with a 17 year old. And when the Commodore found out about it, he went and punched the guy out. And um, then there was another time. Can you remember this when Mary Sue had heard about someone having slept with a minor and she strapped on her knife? and went down and ordered him off the ship. Now, what happened before that, that she did that? It happened, and it was referred to, to HCO for ethics. And the third mate, who was in charge of the first of Division One, and the ethics officer at the time, they were shilly-shallying about what to do. Goodness knows why. And Mary Sue, <coughs> I think, must have just lost patience with the whole thing and she handled it terminatedly by going down and, as you say, pushing the guy off the ship at the end of her knife, her Sea Org Dirk. Right. Yeah. Yep. And that, that handled it. <laughs> yep. He was yep. gone. Yep. And then we, we had another incident with a, a young male messenger who actually had worked for you, and mm -hmm. you were sick, and your replacement who was covering for you had molested him mm -hmm. and I believe he had already left the ship when it was found out about. He was in pack on a mission or something. Is that right, Ken? I don't remember that much. Right. Well, I, I remember seeing a telex or something to, I, I think, the Guardian's office or someone in pack basically saying if this guy does it again or it was to him telling him that he'll be turned over to the guardian's office to have him jailed right you remember it that way too i i don't remember seeing that janice no oh okay it doesn't mean it didn't happen i just don't remember how about right. the story how about the story you told us about lrh slapping um and you heard the slap can you tell us that story well, there's a little more I can tell you about this guy, just to complete the story. Uh, I'd been sick. I was off sick for a week with the flu. Came back, and I think it, either then or not long after, I heard about this incident, and I checked at once with the messenger to ask if he was all right, and to ask also... I asked a few questions. I wanted to know exactly how far it had gone, and it hadn't gone too far. Uh -huh. it, it wasn't a complete disaster for the poor boy. It was bad enough, but it wasn't the worst. And then immediately after that, I got a question from Mary Sue asking if the worst had happened, and I was able to say no. And then I think the next thing was that Nikki Friedman, Mary Sue's communicator, came to me and said, well, didn't you know that this, the person who had done the abusing, the abuser, didn't you know he'd been a bellhop or a bellboy or something? At a hotel. Huh? <laughs> At a hotel? At a hotel, yeah, in, yeah, apparently in New York City. And I had to ask Nikki, I said, well, what's a bellhop? And she told me. And I understood then that he he obviously had some history that I never knew about. And with that history, I don't know why he was in the Sea Org, but there we are. Anyway, right. I, I, that's the last I, rem I remember of that whole thing. Oh, no, the other thing was a few years later, I think I was still on the ship. This The young guy left. I think he went back to L.A. And he sent me a letter one day telling me he'd got married. Oh, okay. that was sweet. Yeah. And Janice, you were telling the story about somebody who got slapped by LRH, right? Yeah, he got, yeah, LRH punched him for having slept with a 17-year-old. Who, who I remember was, that. I was, was this in the same my office. person or this is a different hey? person? It was a different, different person. Can you tell the story without revealing any names? What, what happened? Ken, do you remember it? Yeah. I remember I was in my office. LRH was outside with his messengers. He just had, he'd just done some CSing. 
and he was CSing a particular young lady's folder. And there were there were a few messages to that young lady. And obviously there was some difficulty. There was he was he was insisting on finding something out. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he they fin- he finished all of that and went went out on the on the deck with his me- couple of messengers, and I heard him then call to have someone brought up to him, and it was this young fellow. And then I heard him say, "You seduced," and then there was the sound of a blow on the face, and of a body falling on the deck. And that was the end of that. Yep. Yeah, he he was th- he was then transferred off the ship to Denmark. Right. Right. So Janice, so in your opinion, if if something like Danny Masterson had happened when L. Ron Hubbard was alive and on the lines and knew what was going on, and it had been reported to him, how how would do you think he would have handled it? Would he have have, have turned the person over to the authorities? Anything that they knew if uh, they were charged with uh, raping somebody? Yes, I, I believe he would have had the guardian's office take control of the situation and have him turned in. And and if if someone went light on it and it happened again, that would be the total end. He probably would have had Mary Sue just do it herself. But he did not tolerate that kind of behavior. And Danny, no matter what his celebrity status was, he would have been declared a suppressive person. And that was the real use of declaring someone a suppressive. Right. Any any comment, Ken? No, I agree. Okay. Yeah, he yeah. would have. Ella Rachel would have acted at one. Okay. All right. He, we'll move on. He was, we'll a, move. he was not a fan. He did not support people being promiscuous. I remember one time there was a I, when I was a in the household at St. Hill, uh, there was a guy f- from a foreign country, a young guy who was a student, and he was getting into trouble. And I remember LRH talking about him to Mary Sue at the table and saying in very decided terms, this guy is a sexual nut. So he didn't have much time for promiscuity or extreme art ethics on that line. No, he didn't tolerate it. Right. And, and I remember on the ship when there was a lot of people sleeping around that weren't married, that was in 72, which was a leap year. So he did a Sadie Hawkins thing and put out that any woman who got a man to marry her could be would be promoted in rank. Right. So we had a lot of marriages yeah. to kind of end the bed hopping. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll go on to the next subject. Here's the next slide here. I got to add this in here. Okay. Who, what's that, Janice? Yeah. Well, that's Hobbit on the Diana. And this is the start of the sea project. Ken, you were still at Worldwide as yeah. the communicator then. Well, I don't know what year it was. I had, I had three or four different posts during those years. I had nothing to do with the Sea Org. Right. Ken, Ken, what did you do as L. Ron Hubbard's personal communicator in those days? What were your duties? What 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 did you actually do? Well, okay, I was LRH postcom years after this photo. Okay, but that's fine. I just wanted to just get in general. You know, what right. did what did you do as LRH's personal communicator? I guess my main duty was to help him with his traffic. He was a bit of a micromanager. Uh huh. And people had to write to him to get okay to do this, that, and the next thing. And it was my job to help him with it. the traffic. Was usually was very heavy. It was a he had a big load in his in basket, and he always complained about it. Uh huh. But uh, it was my duty to weed out the dev T. So <laughs> we got to explain with that, Janice. You taught, you mentioned that before. De- uh, dev T is developed traffic, meaning it's extra work that's been generated that didn't need to happen. Yeah, like for instance, if you submitted something to L. Ron Hubbard or anybody really who was a senior and it was incomplete, 
it got sent back to you as dev t because you're basically wasting our time because you didn't you didn't include everything that needed to be there right right, right. well let me tell you what ken used to do with dev t that upset him he would he would throw it at his office door and, and you see these dispatches come flying out and I used to go pick them up and go, Ken, I think you dropped something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got so tired of that job, really so tired. And I remember once I, I got the, I had the three folders of his traffic ready. And I came out of my office to go into his office to put them in his in basket. And I was so sick of the whole thing, I just threw them all down the stairs. And you were sitting at the bottom <laughs> and you told me in no uncertain terms to come down and pick them up. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> I did. Well, of course I had to. <laughs> I'm going to show it's a great term and it's something that I, uh, that I do miss. Here's how you spell it, everybody. It was dev T D E V for developed and T for traffic. So when you were talking about something, hey, don't give me this dev T. That's what you're talking about. Like you're wasting my time with this, with what you've yeah. got here. And it it's was a, a very good, <laughs> right? It was a very good way to make people wrong. <laughs> oh, you're just dev T. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> in the real business, word. in the real yeah. business world executives get handed stuff all the time problems that's the other thing too don't give me your problem give me your solution that was the other yeah. thing that yeah. scientology and l ron hubbard demanded it wasn't like sir we've got this problem there's something going on blah 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 and it was like okay well what's your solution what you're handling don't give me this problem you figure it out and you tell me what you want to do and then i'll okay it either yes or no <laughs> well lrh on his desk had a big red stamp with a red stamp pad remember that ken and he could yeah. stamp something dev t <laughs> yeah. okay that's that's funny but it's, it, it's it, a, it wasn't a work we, we didn't have a workable system right. right because he was he was very particular about what he wanted in his end basket and I would look at this. He issued a, a couple of issues saying, well, you know, I want this and that and the other and nothing else. And I would think to myself, well, you've, you've got a ship full of people here who've given up their lives at home. They're here to help you, support you and serve you. And there are all kinds of education levels going on. There are people who can't spell, people who can't put a sentence together, people who can hardly read. How can you expect them to be this educated all of a sudden to be giving you this perfect staff work? So exactly. uh, I didn't I didn't have a solution. So I was constantly giving him Dev T. I always had a problem. Something sent somebody sent something up. There was information that he needed to have. But there was also Dev T. Mm-hmm. So what do I do? Do I delay the, him getting information so the DevT gets handled? Or do I give him the information so he has it regardless of the DevT? That was my problem every day with everything that went to him. Right. Anyway, to answer your question, I did that. I, I had to prepare his in basket when he got up in the morning. And then I had to take care of all the traffic that came to him during the day. Mm -hmm. And then I had to do whatever else he asked me in particular to do. Very often he would ask me to come in and he'd brief me. I had to take notes. He would tell me to issue this order or that order and I would go back to my office and issue it. Or he would invite me, oh, excuse me, he would order me and the staff captain in for a briefing and I had to take notes and then um, extract any orders that he issued or policies from all of that. He, he might have all of the aides in. He might have two or three aides. And I was, the, I was the kind of the secretary for each of those meetings. Uh, he would <laughs> sometimes call me in and I'd find myself chatting with him mm -hmm. or he'd call me out on the deck and chat with me out there. Yeah. 
I was theoretically supposed to make sure that the aides were in general supporting him, following his policy and carrying out any orders, specific orders that he issued them. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, I was supposed to do that with all of the orders he issued to anybody on the ship. And to tell you the truth, I just couldn't do all of that. I couldn't do, I mean, there was enough to keep at least two or three busy people busy with the orders that he's issued elsewhere on the ship. Right. Yeah. But to make a start on that, I had to leave my desk. Mm -hmm. If I left my desk, traffic to him built up. <laughs> And he would so it was a catch twenty two. It was like yeah. you're damned if you do or damned if you don't, right? Yeah. Well, so. any time, yeah, any time the Commodore had anyone in his office, Ken had to come in to know what was being ordered. Uh huh. Usually, yes. Yeah. Usually. It's almost comparable. Wouldn't you say it's almost comparable to like the president of the United States has a chief of staff? Who basically he's the person who's the gatekeeper to the president. It was wasn't that similar to your job? I don't think so, because right. the staff captain was in charge of operations. But you, but you controlled who went in to see L. Ron Hubbard and who didn't back in those days, right? In other words, I they had to come to. see. They didn't have to come yeah. see you first. They could just go right into his office. Oh, no, no, no. Well, if anybody wanted to see L. R. H., they had to come to me first. Right. Exactly. Or at least for messenger. Yeah, that's yeah. what Nobody I mean. Like, or gatekeeper. Yeah, I get it. Nobody yeah. ever did. Otto okay. Roos did once. <laughs> did he? Yeah, Otto was very upset about something. He just storm pats the messengers into his office. Really? Oh. Yep. The only person I've ever seen do that besides Mary Sue. Do you remember when that was? Uh, it was shortly before he got offloaded. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. I, I have another thing that I wanted. To, you know, we have a lot of viewers who weren't in Scientology, but this is another thing that you probably would have handled and any executive in Scientology would have handled. And that's a CSW, which stands for completed staff work. And what a CSW was or completed staff work was, is basically you were presenting your senior or your, your executive with a, with a solution. There'd be a situation, oh, I want to take a day off. Then you'd put your data. Uh, my production was up this week. It's my turn to have my week to have my day off. And Joe Jones is going to cover my position. And then the solution would be approve my day off. And then you would go, this is OK. Sign your name. And then there'd be a little line where the executive or LRH could, could for approval or disapproval. Right, Ken? That's correct. <laughs> yes. So that that's another thing. That's another Scientology thing. Uh, yeah. where you didn't present your senior with a problem, you presented them with a solution. And that's yeah. called a CSW or completed staff work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I just wanted well, to, you could, to mention you that. Could send, you could, I could send something back with the initial CSWP. <laughs> what does that stand for? Please. CSW, please, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, this, and they would know, the staff would know what that meant. Oh, yes. Okay. All right, we'll go on to the next uh, slide here. So this yeah. is the Royal Scum, and this is actually before it was purchased by the Sea Org, mm -hmm. because we, we painted that uh, smokestack white and put golden LRH on it. But that's pretty much how the Scotland looked when we got her. OK. And this is a picture of uh, the Commodore on the Avon River um before he moved over to the scotman but i wanted to point out here on his cap this is kind of like it's not the real sea oak symbol but it's like some olive branches and there was nothing in the middle so he put the grade four release pin in his cap and there it is there so when you re achieved grade zero, you got the pin without the circle around it. It was just the two triangles and the R. And then when you got grade four release, this is the pin you got with the circle. And that's what he had in his cap. Right there. You can see it right in the middle of the cap between the, uh, the cluster of oak leaves. Yes. Okay. All right. Next. 
This photo is taken probably, what year did you come, Ken? 68, 69? I got to the ship in November 68. November 68. So this was around that time. In the front on the right-hand side is Leon Steinberg. And directly behind him, looking cool in the sunglasses, is Ken. <laughs> and with plenty of hair. <laughs> what, Ken? And plenty of hair. And, and plenty of hair, that's right. Yeah. And then um, on the left, Leon is looking at Art Webb, who I believe he is still at the um, Flag Service Org in Clearwater. And right, and right behind Art is James Byrne, uh -huh. who was at Gold when I left in 1990. He was up in Gold. And behind um, J uh, James is Bill Lawrence. He was the electrician. And behind that is Doug McCullough. He was the brother of Pat McCullough. Uh, Doug was in the engine room, and Pat was on the decks. Ken, and when you no, went to the ship, were you what was your position? What did you do when you went to the ship? When I arrived at the ship, I I was a nothing. I was just a new arrival. Okay. I, now, I, Ken, Ken Delderfield was the post com at that time. That's uh -huh. who you replaced. No, Delderfield was never personal communicator. When I arrived at the ship. I came from worldwide. Uh -huh. Right. And LRH ordered me sent to the ship quietly. I had never volunteered for the Sea Org and I didn't intend to join. But I was sent to the ship and I decided I would go to see what he meant by quietly. That made me curious. So I arrived at the ship and I was greeted by Alex Zaberski, who was Department 1 reception as a new recruit and I said nothing because I was already you know why why would I make any more waves and he put me on a, a new recruit rooting for him but the day after that I was put on a special project for Irene Howie who was CS7 at the time and I did that for a couple of days then I was on a different project and then suddenly I was LRH Karma Apollo Right. And my routing form had got lost and forgotten about. So that's how I started. And in between that, somehow, I bumped into LRH on the stairs, and he was very warm and very welcoming and very friendly. There was no, I, he, I obviously wasn't in trouble with him. So that's really why I stayed. Well, let me ask you right. oh, Yeah, sorry. go ahead. No, I didn't. Oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh -huh. I was going to say, with with LRH, once once you got that warm feeling from him again, you were always curious to know what he would be up to next. Oh. My question: I was going to ask you when you yes. were at Saint Hill in Worldwide, everybody referred to him as Ron, right? So when you got on the ship, did you yes. call him Ron, or was he Sir at that point? I would have called him Sir. Got it. But I think yeah. in our conversation, we were just speaking very friendly fashion so i don't think i called him anything okay now i want to just explain um ken referred to irene being cs7 that was commodore's staff for division seven and okay. as from that position it, she was also basically the lrh personal communicator because everything went through her as cs7 got it all right here's and the then next after photo. that was that when dell took over from her I think so, yes. Yeah, yeah. Ken Delderfield. I actually knew Ken from Australia. His wife, right. Rosemary, was our receptionist at our mission. Uh -huh. And then they were all part of the whole leave Australia and go to St. Hill group, uh, Rosemary and Ken Delderfield. Right. Yeah, so yep. I knew them back then, and then there was Ken on the ship handling personal communications of Hobbits, and then right. uh, Ken Urquhart replaced him. All right, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Yeah, in this picture, um, I'm pretty much the one in the very center there with my hand up to my chin. And though Ken is behind me on my left or on the photo right with the sunglasses on, uh, he's a little behind me, though. It looks like we're holding hands, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
And where where do you think this photo was taken? This was we. This was, looks like Casablanca, in okay. Morocco. And uh, I believe the ship was in dry dock at this time. So we did a lot of stuff ashore. Bathrooms were ashore. Showers were ashore. You know, and musters were ashore. There wasn't much room with the renovations going on in the dry dock. Okay. And this is a picture of uh, LRH and Mary Sue on the dock. They were probably headed towards the Chris Craft, which was a, a small boat that the Commodore had that was carried around on the forward well deck of the Royal Scotsman. And there he is um, steering the boat. And then the next picture is of Mary Sue at the helm of the boat. And this is just to kind of establish, you know, this is the Sea Org now. Did they, would they just go out on, on nice rides for a nice afternoon, that type of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they would sometimes take the Chris Craft or sometimes he might take one of his cars. He had a uh, yellow Pontiac on the ship. He had that car at St. Hill. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, how'd I they remember. How did they get it on and off the ship? Did they use a crane or what did they yeah, do? Yeah, we had a boom crane and that would take the boat on and off and, and take the cars. Okay. And, and this was in Corfu at the christening of changing the Royal Scotsman to the Apollo. And you were both there? Yeah, I was there and Ken was there. I was actually on duty because before this, I had to run messages to Bob Young and I believe Neville Chamberlain to make sure the bottle was gonna hit and break. Oh, for the champagne? <laughs> yeah, the champagne. For, yeah, when he when the ribbon was to be cut. Ken, do you have any memories of this event? I just remember watching them rehearse on the on the key. They were they they had people from the crew marching up and down, and they looked kind of ridiculous. Trying to be a navy. Not very professional. <laughs> and, no. and we had local officials all attending as well. Oh yes, and they. There was a big party aboard, wasn't there? Yeah, yep. Yeah. And and the Commodore attended the party afterwards. He was yeah. very social, more social in those days. Yes. Okay. And that's the rechristened yeah. Apollo, right? Yep. Well, at first she was still black when she got rechristened. Yeah. And it wasn't until several months later that uh, we went back in the dry dock and then uh, made her white. Do you remember where the where the painting happened? Which dry dock? Like where it was? Lisbon. Uh, in Lisbon. No, Casablanca. No. When we made Casablanca. You think so? Yeah, in '69, because we didn't do the Lisbon dry dock until '72. Oh, okay. All right. Next one. And, and this is uh, the Commodore in his research room, his office, standing at his desk. And we put this in, this is his kind of regular day-to-day -day dress. He'd wear like a blue shirt and a blue cardigan vest and a lanyard around his uh, neck. Okay. And he'd carry his cool cigarettes in his right-hand pocket of the pants. Ken, did you have an office near his research room on the Apollo? Yes, just across the landing. Okay. Yeah, his, Ken's office was the closest office to the research room. Okay. It was kind of, you had Ken's office, you had the messengers outside, and then uh, the Commodore's office. Ken, let me ask you a question. What was your relationship with, with the messengers when he started having these 12 and 13 and 14 year old kids running around all the time? How did that, how did that go over at the time? It was, I had, I think I had good relations with all of them. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of the newer ones were snotty, I remember. <laughs> but, was it uh, Janice? No. I used to ask him what a Scotsman wore under his kilt. Uh. <laughs> no, I was I was administratively in charge of the the messengers. Yeah, they were in the personal office, and I was in charge of the personal office. Uh -huh. I had very little to do with them administratively. Right. But uh, very often, if if he gave them a message and they didn't know quite what to do. They'd come to me. Uh huh. 
well, they came to me pretty often I'd, in that kind of situation, and I would help them out, and I had no trouble at all. So they'd run off and do it. Uh, there was one messenger I remember. I think she'd brought out the... The, uh, he'd finished his in-basket, so she brought the contents out to me, and I was sitting at my desk, at the, and she came in, and I was sitting sideways so that my feet were on the floor out in the open. Normally, I sat with my feet under the desk, uh -huh. and this messenger noticed my feet, and at that particular time, I was wearing um, very thin socks. Yeah, only because I'd I'd bought the things and they were kind of thin, but they, they, I had no problem with them. And this messenger looked at my feet and she says, "Oh, what long skinny toes you have!" <laughs> I was wearing sandals. I wore sandals a lot. And then she said, "Is that why you always wear socks?" And I said, "No, that's all I said." But I mean. <laughs> I couldn't have worn, I, in that position. I couldn't have worn sandals and no socks, regardless of whether my toes were fat or skinny. It wouldn't have been appropriate. Who was and, that? Yeah, huh? Which messenger was that? She's talking to me right now. <laughs> was that you, Janice? <laughs> <laughs> Janice has a habit of just telling it like it is. <laughs> I do. And and Ken actually brought that up on the ship. He knew that I I will just tell it as it is. <laughs> there was another little incident I had with Janice. It was very late at night and she was on her own. So I think it was when there were two messengers at a time and the other messenger was gone for a long time. Mm -hmm. Things were very quiet. It was very late. And suddenly I noticed that Janice was in her chair, fast asleep. <laughs> and I totally understood that she was asleep because we were all tired. We were all tired all the time. Yeah. So I, I didn't quite know how to wake her up to keep her out of trouble in case the old man called for her and saw that she was asleep. So I stood in the door of the, the bar, which was opposite where she sat, and I pressed on her toe with my foot. <laughs> and then she, she woke up with a guilty start, which I think must have alerted Ellerich to the fact that she'd been the sheep, but he, he said nothing. Yeah, but, well, well, uh, I remember there were times, Ken, I'd fall asleep and my head would fall back and hit the wall yeah. and that would wake me up <laughs> yeah i'm not that's surprised funny. it was a terrible schedule that's yeah funny. anyway after a while when he got back in 73 he got very he was not so happy with me uh -huh. so one of the things he did was he issued an order saying that the, the messengers were no longer under me uh -huh. and that was fine with me yeah so, but the, the next major thing I remember was he he had told Terry to design a new uniform. And she sent up her CSW, and it was for the, the white uniform with the very short pants and the high heel. And I didn't really think this was going to be appropriate. <laughs> for a man in his position to have these young ladies dressed like that around me just didn't seem right to me. Yeah. But knowing that, of course, I was no longer on the line, I had to send it in. And much to my surprise, he approved it. Mm. Well, Terry had told me that he's the one who had given her the ideas on what to propose. Really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, now I thought that was it when we hit the Caribbean that we moved to those uniforms. Because when we were in Portugal and Spain and Morocco, it was the long pants. Right. Because yeah. of the, the culture at that time, you just, women wore long dresses and did not right. wear shorts. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that so could be a. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so when we got to the Caribbean, that's when we moved to those white shorts. 
Right. Okay. Here's the next uh, slide here. Who's that dapper man? <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> I never had a daughter. <laughs> Explain, Janice. Well, this was Jill. Uh, Jill uh, Kostrom was going to get married to Alan Buchanan, and Ken was her father. And so, Ken, you can. Uh, what were you going to say when you were giving her away? Well, I, I was supposed to get. I was prompted to at, after the wedding. I was prompted to propose a toast to the bride and groom. And I remember <laughs> that I'd known my daughter for four years. <laughs> um, yeah, everybody chuckled. But uh, Mary Sue was present, so I didn't say the rest of what I wanted to say, which was that I didn't, I wasn't really happy about giving her away because she was worth quite a bit of money. <laughs> 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 and then I was, I wanted to say that knowing her as well as I did, I wished her new husband all the best of luck in the world. <laughs> but so, uh, I think Mary Sue was present, so I toned it down. I didn't say those things. Right. Go ahead, Janice. Who was in this? This is the same wedding, right? Yeah. This is this is the wedding party. On the left is John Horwich, who became Hubbard's uh, son-in-law later on, and then Jill Castrum, and she married Alan Buchanan. And the young girl in front is Val Schomer, also known as Valerie Page. And behind her is Tony Dunleavy and his wife, Kimma Dunleavy, who became Kimma Douglas. And then Ken is on the right. Okay. And then this picture, you know, I think this, my mom had just married uh, Joan and Stu Moreau. Uh -huh. And my mom is there, having been the minister. Behind her is Rich Cohen. But mom is talking to Ken and to Fred Hare. Fred yeah. Hare was the deputy controller for Snow White. Okay. And we'll go to the next one here. And here is, on the right, is Vicki Berman. She was Mary Sue Stewart. And then Mary Sue in the front with Ken looking dapper with a mustache. <laughs> and, and the cravat too, right? The cravat, you're wearing a cravat or ascot or something? Yeah, yeah. an ascot. Yep. And, and you're then, developing a belly. My waist was getting big. I said my waist was getting a bit expanded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, it is bigger than it normally was. <laughs> And well, but next to Ken is Tony Dunleavy, who was the staff captain at the time. And then next to Tony is Jill Kostrom, Jill Buchanan, and then Robin Roos. Okay. Now in this picture, this is John Horwich getting married to Diana Hubbard. I'll go from the right to the left. The right is Quentin, and then you can see Mary Sue's face cut off. And then Arthur's back is to the camera. Then, of course, John and Diana. And her maid of honor was her sister, Suzette Hubbard. And behind Suzette is Ken hiding. And then Otto Roos. Okay. And then, Ken, uh, somebody asked about Otto Roos. Do you have a story about Otto Roos? Well, it's quite a few. Yeah, the first time I met Otto, he had just arrived at St. Hill from New Zealand along with Robin. I was in the household and one evening I, it was dark, so it must have been in the winter. I had served the meal and I was going back to the kitchen. On the passage near the kitchen, there was a niche, a, a space off the passage. It was, it was big enough to hold a big fridge Mm -hmm. But of course, we didn't have big fridges in those days. And for what it was for, I don't know. But anyway, I'm passing this space on my way back to the kitchen, and I become aware that there were two people in this niche. Yeah. And it was, it was Otto and Robin, looking very sheepish. Mm -hmm. And they explained that they had just come from New Zealand. And they wanted to speak to Ron 
and I think they said they wanted, maybe they had a gift for him or they just wanted to say hello and thank you. And I explained to him that he was just finishing his meal with Mary Sue and could they kindly come back the next day during the day and go through HCO. So that was, the, and I remember Robin with her teeth and her big eyes. She had a beanie on, which looked kind of funny. And Otto with his wandering eye. And he, he wasn't too confident at that particular time. Mm-hmm. Anyway, later I was LRH Com St. Hill and Otto was Orgig Zexak St. Hill. He was a bully. He bullied Monica Carino was H so Zexak and he bullied her and I tried to support her. Uh it then it came out that Otto had been on a bed with a briefing course student who was a mature little woman. She wasn't a girl. Mm-hmm. And there had been some kind of play on his part. And this was very much against the rules that anybody should have sex or sexual relations with a St. Hill briefing course student. Right. So there was a huge fuss at St. Hill, and he was comment. LRH intervened. Now, this was after L- um Otto, who was a trained accountant, had done a special project for LRH, which was to go through all of St. Hill's books and all of the corporation books and find out how much LRH, how much money LRH had put into these organizations and how much they owed him. And Otto, knowing which side his bread was buttered on, made sure it was a very big sum. Wow. It was about thirteen million pounds. Wow. In those days, that would be about a probably a hundred or hundred and fifty million today. Well, this pleased LRH no end. However, I to go back to the time later when he was in ethics trouble with a student. Uh, LRH found out that this was being done. He was away at, at the Sea Org, and he ordered all of the people on Exec Council who were trying to put some ethics in on Otto, he ordered us all sector. And predictably, the result was, LRH could say, that we had all done much, much worse than what what Otto was accused of. So he got off scot-free, and we were made to look a bit stupid. Is that when Robin divorced Otto? No. I'm not quite sure when she did, but they were they were on the ship together. Whether they were married or not, I just don't know. I don't remember. Right. Anyway, the next thing is with Otto, he's off to the Sea Org. He comes back, and I think it's the time he's back when I had been declared clear. And... In those days, when a person got declared clear, they went they went on Thursday afternoon into the chapel where the, the students had their weekly meeting mm-hmm. and did all their success things. And the, the, the new clears stood up and said something. And I was due to do that at this particular Thursday afternoon. And before I could start, there was a voice, Otto was at St. Hill on mission from the ship. He didn't have anything to do with me particularly on his mission. But there I am standing at the back, and Otto says in my ear, will you announce me, please, Ken? And I was not happy at all to do so. But I had to say, I had to yell out, Otto, Lieutenant Otto Ruth, so everybody could be quiet and let big Otto strut down the middle and do whatever he had to do. (laughs) And I, then after that, I didn't have much to do with Otto until I got to the ship. And then I didn't really have much to do with him because he was either on the deck or in tack. He, when I became CS7, and particularly when I became first calm, he got very friendly. 
and he would invite me to go down here and there on the ship with him and I come to but he was very happy to be seen down on the ship with me then uh, he became a class 12 and I think on his own back he took me into session to order me on the elves okay and I remember the auditing I remember noticing his worksheets as I got up to leave session he left the phone room and all I, all you could see was big squiggles there was nothing I could see that was legible and I had no idea how on earth anybody could be CSing this however that was not my problem. but I used to, being in session with him I took the chance to tease him and I would say something you know, like he, if he did something that I didn't think was quite correct I would say something about squirreling just to push his button <laughs> oh. <laughs> well it pushed him a little too hard because I think up after about the second or third session we sat he took me into session sat down and before he started the session he was telling me about how if he was down on the twin deck someone said the word world to him he'd punch him in the face <laughs> so i took the hint and came off that little <laughs> yeah yeah he wasn't, he wasn't too smart of me anyway but anyway yeah. I, I had very good gains from that order he, 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 he eventually got kicked off the ship right he was l ron hubbard declared him and everything yeah, yeah, but I was going to ask Ken. Ken, do you remember when Otto hit his head in the tween decks and knocked himself unconscious? And uh, the Commodore went, someone ran up and told the Commodore, because I was on watch and we came down and he did a whole assist to bring him to and then had him go through a contact assist and go back through the motion of it and everything. I think that was before I came to the ship. Oh, okay. Yeah, everyone was worried because Otto was out like a light. You're right. Yeah. Listen, before we go on, I just want to remind everybody here, please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We have great content, great interviews with the people like Ken Urquhart. And uh, we really appreciate it if you subscribe. Hit that like button also and the notification.